Hungry Hearts Service in Jackson, Tennessee. I want to thank you for watching today's message. Hungry Hearts is a non-denominational church which is Torah observant and spirit filled with the use of certain Hebrew worship tools. We believe that Yeshua Messiah died to pay for our sins and because he died to pay for our sins and we've accepted that payment, we live by God's laws and commandments. We're filled with God's spirit, we worship him with it, and we practice the gifts. Today's message is about the Sabbath. Uh, I want to start in Acts chapter 10. It's the story of Cornelius. Cornelius is the first Gentile to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of, of misconceptions about Cornelius. Cornelius is a pure-blood Gentile. He is, a, he is an Italian. He is not an Israelite of any kind, lost, known, or otherwise. But in Acts chapter 10, starting in verse 1, at Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. Now, God-fearing is a technical term. It does not mean those people who are afraid of God. Though there's a certain level of respect in God-fearing. God-fearing is a technical term, and what it means is this person is attached to a Jewish synagogue, and they're one step below a proselyte. A proselyte of the Jews lives by certain tenets of the faith and has been circumcised. He's not Jewish by blood. He's Jewish by faith. A God-fearer, which is what Cornelius is, goes to a Jewish synagogue. He keeps the weekly Sabbath. He keeps the annual holy days. He follows the dietary laws, and he pays one-tenth of his income to the synagogue. This is what God-fearing means. It is a technical term. You can look this up in Wycliffe's commentary on this verse. You'll find exactly what I just told you. It is a common technical term. And so last time I was with you, we spoke about do I have to, and we talked about this way of life that we teach called Torah observance, and we asked the question, do I have to, and I hope I answered it satisfactorily that yes, you do. And so today we're going to go through the tenets, uh, start with the tenets of a God fear. This week we're going to work on the Sabbath. Next time I come back in two weeks, we're going to work on the dietary laws. And then we're going to go through the holy days and we're going to go into tithing. So I want you to understand what God-fearing is. So when you talk about people that say, I fear God, this is, this is what it means whether they mean that when they say it or not. Before I get into today's message, I want to offer you our free quarterly magazine, Pursuit. If you email me at HungryHeartsMIN at AOL.com, I will send you this magazine free of charge every quarter without any obligation. The only thing we use your address for is to mail you this magazine and to invite you to a meeting if we're in your area. Uh, other than that, we're never going to ask you for money. We don't ask you for any obligations. If you decide to join, that's, that's your business. We hope you enjoy watching and we hope you tune in. Just what is the Sabbath? Go about the weekly Sabbath. So the, the Muslims worship on Friday, the Jews worship on Saturday, the Christians worship on Sunday. But what is God's Sabbath? What is, how does God define the Sabbath? And just exactly what is the Sabbath? Is it just a time to go to church? I mean, exactly what is this? And why does it generate so much controversy? There's so much interest in the Sabbath and there's so much animosity. You know, if you tell somebody that uh, Wednesday's my, my day, everybody's good with that. Oh, yeah, Wednesday, that's your day. One day at seven. Oh, yeah, Wednesday. Yeah, man, I got you. Yeah, Wednesday, that's good. But when you tell them that Saturday is your Sabbath, man, it, man it, it's like they want to string you up. What do you mean Saturday's the Sabbath? You can't go to church on Saturday. How dare you go to church? So why the animosity to the Saturday Sabbath? The Sabbath is a 24-hour space of time for you to get into the presence of God. It's just that simple. The day start at sunset and they end at sunset. I know that's counterintuitive, but when you go to the book of Genesis, evening and morning, the first day, evening and morning, the second day, evening and morning, the third day. So in God's time, the day start at sundown because there was a period of darkness over this earth and God stepped in and made it light. And so he starts the days at nighttime to remind us every single day that he brought light out of darkness. Oh, come on, somebody. That was a good place to jump and shout right there. Right there. 
Many in the, in the Sabbath keeping community even overlook this primary importance of God's Sabbath by getting into the presence of God and receiving a supernatural infilling of the Holy Spirit. They overfocus on rest. Now, look, I need rest. I work for a living. I'm bivocational. For those of you out there in TV land, I'm bivocational. If you want to email me at hungryheartsmin at AOL.com, I'll send you our financial report, and you can see that nobody at Hungry Hearts gets any money from Hungry Hearts. Everybody you see up here speaking pays tithes. None of us receive tithes. We all work at our own expense. It is an all-volunteer operation. Uh, so I work for a living. I work hard for a living. My, my, my job requires manual labor. And so I'm tired. I need rest. When I get to Friday night, I am spent. As a matter of fact, I, you know, we talk about crashing into the Sabbath because you're just so tired you can't do anything. I have had plenty of Friday nights where after dinner I passed out in a chair. Just passed out from exhaustion. I understand that. So people say, I, I couldn't make it. I was just On Friday night, I was just too tired. I understand. I have done that plenty of times. When people fall asleep in the worship when we do a Friday night, I understand. You know how many times I've passed out in the worship? Well, come on, parents. When your babies fell asleep in your arms, you didn't get upset. See, God doesn't get upset. Oh, come on. He doesn't get upset either. Rest is important. But the refreshing we get from the Holy Spirit is much, much more important. I can rest on Sunday. I can rest on Monday. I can take a nap on Tuesday. But I can't get the outpouring of the Holy Ghost any other day but Sabbath. It's the only day. Now, that doesn't give you a pass to work. If you work, you miss it. What God pours out on Shabbat, if you work on that day, you cannot have it. You broke the day, you're cut off. You can't have it. Hmm. The Sabbath is every Sabbath day, seventh day, and we know it on our calendars as Saturday. So it starts Friday night at sundown to this afternoon on sundown. That is the Sabbath. And we're going to talk about time being lost, and we're going to talk about how God reset the time. The Sabbath is also a feast day. It is the first feast day in, in Leviticus 23 where God lists all of his feasts. It is a feast day. It is a time for you to celebrate before the Lord your God. And it's very important that you do so. Now, for more information on the Sabbath, I'm offering this free booklet. You can email me at HungryHeartsMIN at AOL.com. You can call me at 731-736-1055. Give me your mailing address. Just leave it on the machine, and I will mail this to you for no cost whatsoever. It's our free booklet, God's Holy Sabbath. This is an amazing little book. This is actually the first piece of literature I ever wrote. I'm kind of proud of it still, and I give you a lot of reasons why you need to keep the Sabbath. Free of charge. All you got to do is write in and ask. It is very special, the Sabbath. It is very special. It is holy time with God. Let's go to Genesis chapter 2, and I'm going to show you the Sabbath day. This is before the law. This is before Moses. This is before Aaron. This is before Adam. The Sabbath has always existed. It's eternal. Noah kept the Sabbath. Or he wouldn't have been saved on the boat. Now that's a powerful lesson for the rescue of the saints. Noah would not have been saved on that boat if he wasn't keeping Sabbath. I'm just saying. <clears throat> so in Genesis chapter 2, uh, verse 2, By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So God, the creation's finished. At the end of day six, everything is done. Mankind is made. Adam and Eve are standing there. Everything's all good. He's uh, looked at all the stuff. Oh, the earth is completely renewed. There's day and night. There's stars, sun, moon. There's fruit trees. You don't have to work for your food. Just go pick the fruit and eat it off the trees, right? <clears throat> Everything is good to go. The temperature is comfortable. Everybody's happy. There's clean spring water coming out of the ground to drink. And you don't have to do anything but just hang out and chill. So on the seventh day, he rested. So he's finished working, so he rests. So the first six days, he has recreated the entire surface of this planet. He has restored the atmosphere and the habitat and the conditions to be perfect for human life. Everything's perfect. The Hebrew here connotates perfection. The height and typical perf type of perfection. And then on the seventh day, he creates something else by resting. 
The other six days he created by working, and now on the seventh day, he is going to create something brand new by resting. <coughs> and God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. He made the seventh day holy. Now, the first day can't be holy. The second day can't be holy. The third day can't be holy. None of these days can be holy except the seventh day, which he made holy. Now, that doesn't mean you can't do holy things on these other days, but the days themselves are not holy. So when you go to church on Sunday, you're a day late and a dollar short. It's just there's no way to get around it. Because Sunday's the first day, and you already missed the seventh day. So the Holy Ghost was poured out on the seventh day. God's rest was on the seventh day. As the least got word last week, it's the portal to enter on the seventh day. When you get to Sunday, it's closed. You ain't going in. It was open to you on the seventh day, and you didn't take it. So I'm asking you to take it. Come on to church on the seventh day and taste and see that the Lord is good. That He will not pour out so much blessing in here that you won't be able to handle it all. And we routinely have people who come in that can't handle it all. Too much blessing. Too much blessing. So God created the Sabbath by resting. And when He created He put a blessing in it for you. That means, <clears throat> that is what it means when He says He blessed it. He put a blessing in there for you. You keep it, you get blessed. Well, Lisa, I've been doing this for almost 35 years. We have not missed a Sabbath in that time. And there's a blessing in every one of them. I've kept Sabbaths when I was sick in bed and thought I was going to die. I've kept Sabbaths when I was euphoric. I kept Sabbaths when my children were born. Matter of fact, my firstborn was born on the Sabbath. I have kept Sabbath in every possible condition. And the Lord has been there every single one of them. Every single one. 34 and something years is a lot of Sabbaths, amen? 34 by 52. And he made it holy. None of us can make anything holy. None of us can make anything holy. Jesus said we can't even make one hair white or black, how much less holy or common. But God has made this recurring space of time holy. Every seventh day, the time is holy. And so he has commanded us to keep it holy, and we'll get to that in a minute. So how do you keep something holy? You, you can only keep it holy if it starts holy. Amen. You can't make it holy. You can only keep it holy. It's like uh, uh, Mr. Armstrong used to say, you can't keep cold water hot. You can only keep hot water hot. So when you come to holy time, you keep it holy by doing holy things. That means you finish your common activity on Friday afternoon. Oh, come on. Now, you don't want to crash into the Sabbath. I mean, I have. It's not very fun. You don't feel good about it. <clears throat> so you want to wrap that mess up in the mid-afternoon so you can prepare yourself to be holy when holy gets here. Oh, come on. That was good right there now. That was good. That was good. We walk in the Spirit for the day. You do spirit things. You do spiritual things. So people in spiritual church talk to me about doing spiritual things in the middle of the week. But that's not where the power is. The power's on the Sabbath. The Sabbath is where you have God's power making it spiritual, and all you got to do is get in there and go with it. Oh, that was good, man. How did y'all miss that? <clears throat> He's already made it Holy Ghost spiritual, holy for the day. All you got to do is roll with it. It's already there. See, when you're on Wednesday, you got to work it up because it ain't there and it ain't going to be there. It's only what you can work up. Well, somebody get that tomorrow. <clears throat> the work I do is, is, is not, not holy work. It's not holy work. It's common work. It's unclean work some of the time. And so I can't be holy during the work week very often. But see, that's one reason God told you don't work on the Sabbath is so that you have no excuse to be unclean or common. You can only be holy unless you choose not to be holy. Amen? Because he told you not to go to work. So you shut down on Friday afternoon like you're supposed to. You clean up, wash, and put on some clean clothes. You're ready to enter into holy time. Amen? And it doesn't change until tonight at sundown. So unless you go out and mess it up, it's already set. 
You can't mess it up. See, I like that. I like that. I like when God sets things up and you just can't mess them up. That's really good. <coughs> My dad told me one time I could mess up a crowbar. <coughs> This is why you put away your own desires and come to God on Shabbat. See, he's cleared the deck so you can really do nothing else of any consequence. So just clean up. Come on to church. We'll have a big time. Now, for those of you in TV land, you missed a great worship service. You need to go, go to your cable provider, and you need to ask for worship vision on your cable so you can feel the anointing when you're watching this on YouTube because it, it was pretty good in here. Amen? Well, a couple of them had it good. Now... <coughs> <clears throat> now, how can you know that Saturday here at the end of time is the Sabbath? I mean, God gave it to Adam and Eve at the beginning of time. You remember the Flintstones movie? When it opens up and it's like year two or year three or year four or something like that, and the guy's lighting the torches on the lamp poles, right? You know, and we're at the very beginning of time. Some of y'all got that. See, you know, some of y'all didn't have kids. You didn't watch these movies. But there was more adult stuff in there than kid stuff. You need to go back and watch the Flintstones movie. It's a real... See, I shouldn't be advertising that on YouTube. <coughs> it's not a, not a very good movie, but it is a good movie. So anyway, how can we know that the time is straight in 2019 when we've messed up everything else? I couldn't even watch the news this week. We've messed everything up so bad. Is it just me, or did the Democrats all go insane at once? I don't know what your political affiliation may be out there, but the stuff the stuff I saw in the news this week is the craziest stuff I've ever heard in my life. And, you know, frankly, I grew up during the Cold War, and if anybody espoused these views, we would have laughed them off the school grounds. Nobody would have. Look, look I'll tell you how old I am. In 1979, when I was in college at the University of Florida, we held demonstrations like all the college kids hold demonstrations. But whereas all the other people were demonstrating for crazy stuff, we blocked off Main Street, we had big giant banners, we filled the place, and you know what we were demonstrating for? Nuke Iran till they glow. Funny, Iran's back. We need to nuke Iran till they glow because these people are crazy and they're sick and they're messing with the wrong folks. You don't come around and see. When I was in college, they had 454 hostages, American hostages in Iran. We we, we should have put an end to that mess back then. Amen? Amen. And I believe I believe the news uh, ran this a number of years back. But when Ronald Reagan had won the presidency, and when they were setting up the transition team. James Baker was dispatched to talk to the mullahs in some uh, uh, disinterested third world, third country. And he, he got across the table and he said, let me just explain to you something there, boys. When, when that man takes his hand off the Bible after he's taken the oath of office, he's going to nuke your ASS. That's what James Baker, I remember watching James Baker tell that story. And you know what? Uh, when Ronald Reagan and Jimmy Carter were in the limo going to the Capitol for the inauguration, I ran released all those hostages. Y'all remember that? It was the day of the inauguration. And I was watching it on TV. And then they broke in. They're showing the two presidents going on down to the Capitol. And then in the middle they busted in. Oh, Iran just released those hostages. Let me tell you something, you mullahs over there. We don't do it to you. You just don't realize. You messing with the wrong folks. Somebody's going to pop a cap on you in a minute, and, and you ain't going to see it coming. Because we got stealth now. You never know what happened till it's over. So you, you best quit messing with the U.S. Because you know what? The people in my generation that wanted to nuke you in 79 are in power over here now. Oh, come on, somebody. Hey, we don't care what uh, Alexandra Ocasio, whatever her name is, she can just take her happy rear end back to New York, and we ain't got no use for her. We will do something to you boys over in Iran if you don't back down. So much for my little rap rabbi trail. Let's go to Exodus 16. Uh, may be quiet up in here, but everybody's nodding. Yeah, everybody's nodding. Look, this is the South, honey. We don't, we, don't, we don't play games with stuff like that. This is called the volunteer state for a reason. So for those of you on TV who don't know, Tennessee has always volunteered more soldiers than voters. Yeah. 
Remember Sergeant York. <coughs> Exodus 16, verse 21. <coughs> so this is the story of the giving of manna, and everybody thinks that this manna was given to feed the Israelites. Wrong. God didn't give the manna to feed the Israelites. He gave the manna to show them when the Sabbath was. And because he knows how hard-headed we are, I mean they are, <coughs> He had to give it to them for 40 years because he knew if he only gave it to them for a couple weeks, they'd never figure it out. He knew if he was only going to give them manna for a couple weeks or a couple months to show them the Sabbath, they'd turn around and go, well, it really wasn't that day. Somebody going to argue with it. So he had to give them the manna six days and off on seventh, six days and off on seventh for 40 years to make sure they understood which day was the Sabbath. And you want to know something? We are still so stupid that when the tribes of Israel split into two nations, the ones we came out of gave up the Sabbath first thing. That's why we don't know in America who we really are. And our Jewish brethren do because they kept the Sabbath, but it was us hard-headed, stubborn Israelites from the house of Joseph. We ditched the Sabbath first thing, and we don't know who we are. There's a reason why the United States is the greatest nation on earth. It's because we're the house of Joseph. It's not just accidental. We didn't just get this because we're special. We didn't get it because we're smarter. We didn't get it because of our great constitution. We got our great constitution because we're the house of Joseph, and God was making us a great nation. We didn't come up with all this stuff. It was given to us by God. <clears throat> and if we want to keep our constitution, we had better get back to the Sabbath, because if we don't, God's going to wreck this place. Verse 21, each morning everyone gathered as much as they needed, and when the sun grew hot, it melted away. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much, two quarts for each person, and the leaders of the community came and reported this to Moses. He said to them, this is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow is the Sabbath day. So you go out on Friday, and you get twice as much, and then you don't go out at all on Sabbath. Now, earlier in the week, you could only get the day's amount and you were told, don't save it up. Yep. Well, some knuckleheads did. <clears throat> and it bred worms and stank. Mm -hmm. I bet these were the same knuckleheads that go out on Sabbath, right? See, they, they, they tried to gather too much and hold it up, and it didn't work. So then when Friday they're told to gather twice a month, oh, no, I ain't doing that. I did that already, man. That's a mess. I'm not doing that again. We'll just go out on Saturday. It'll be all right. God wants us to eat, doesn't he? Yeah, there's the ones that settle the settling in the south, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was just settled in West Tennessee, right? <laughs> yeah. So tomorrow, the seventh day, is the day of rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. So bake what you want to bake, boil what you want to boil, save whatever's left and keep it till morning. So they saved it until morning as Moses commanded, and it did not stink or get maggots in it. Eat it today, Moses said, because it is the Sabbath to the Lord. You will not find any manna on the ground today. Six days you're to gather manna, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will not be any manna. So he repeats this process every week, 52 weeks, 40 years, 2,000 times to make sure they got it. And our folks still couldn't get it. And at some point, you've got to wonder if it's not willful. And so we're out here telling people that Saturday's the Sabbath. See how our ancestors were? I'm not going to turn it, but you can go to the breaking up of the kings with Rehoboam and Jeroboam and all this stuff. First thing Jeroboam did was get rid of Sabbath. Is it any wonder why we have a hard time explaining to people they've got to go to church on Saturday? It's always been a hard time explaining to these people they've got to go to church on Saturday. They never got this from the beginning. <clears throat> <clears throat> Nevertheless, some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather it, and they found none. Then the Lord said to Moses, How long will you refuse to keep my commandments? See, they went out on Sabbath to get manna. That's, bear in mind that the Lord's giving you a Sabbath. That's why on the sixth day he gives you bread for two days. He gives you bread for two days. And so our people... Didn't want to do it then. They don't want to do it now. But you don't have to be like that. You don't have to be like that. You can join the Lord right now. You don't have to be hostile on the Sabbath. You don't have to push Him off. You, you just come on and keep the Sabbath. And it will be a joy and a blessing to you. And you will get that extra measure of Holy Spirit power. Again, write me for my free booklet, God's Holy Sabbath. 
HungryHeartsMIN at AOL.com, Post Office Box 10334, Jackson, Tennessee, 38308. Get this free booklet. It will change your life. Then while you're at it, request our free magazine, Pursuit. It's got all kind of great articles on lots of deep Bible subjects. This is some of the best Bible exposition I have ever read in all of my years of doing this. And it's right here for free every quarter for you. So this is how God reset time. He reset time and he's going to give them the Sabbath and he's going to feed them and he's going to take care of them. And people from the beginning have always bowed up. So when they bow up to you as you're telling your friends about the Sabbath or your family, oh, I go to church on Saturday and they blow This is why. This is why they don't want to do it. This is why they blow up. Now, fortunately for us, our, our special Jewish brethren have kept this Saturday Sabbath intact all through time. Even over the best efforts of certain churches to persecute them out of it, they've still kept it. Even when they don't observe it, they still keep the Sabbath. They keep the knowledge of it. They talk about it. They never let it go because they know this is their identity. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute. <clears throat> so we owe the Jewish people an enormous debt of gratitude, if for nothing else, preserving the Sabbath day. Frankly, you wouldn't have any of your Old Testament if it wasn't for them. So we owe them a lot bigger debt of gratitude than just the Sabbath. But the Sabbath is a great place to start. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so let's go to Leviticus. And we're going to talk about the feast days of the Lord. And we're going to explain why sunset to sunset. And I talked to you a little bit about Genesis. Sunset to sunset in Genesis. Evening and morning, first day. Evening and morning, second day. We're going to go to a place where God is talking about the holiest day of the year, the Day of Atonement, or Yom Kippur, and he's going to lay this out for us very clearly. In uh, Leviticus 23, in the second half of verse 32, from the evening of the ninth day of the month until the following evening, you're to observe this festival. And so this is the tenth day of the seventh month, and he's explaining to us that the tenth day of the seventh month starts on the sundown on the ninth, to sundown on the 10th. <clears throat> this is how you are to observe the holiest day of the year. It is also called the Shabbat Sabbatom, or the Sabbath of Sabbaths. And so when we come to Sabbath, this is how you reckon it. Friday night to Saturday night. Sundown to sundown. And it's, it's uh, phenomenal. I've been doing this for 34 plus years. It's been fabulous. Actually, Lenise and I just want to say we started in the fall of 85. So we've been doing this a long, long time. And it's been magnificent. I want to go back to Genesis chapter 1. And I want to show you where this comes from in Leviticus. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 1 and verse 3. God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. Now notice he's got them light and dark, right? But look how he reverses the order. And there was evening, and there was morning. It's one day. So he's showing us that everything was dark on this earth before God came in and made it light. And that is why days start at sundown. It's to honor that process. We honor the Sabbath because we're honoring the process of creation and the holiness that he made in it. So everything we're teaching you goes right back to the very first book of the Bible. Amen? This is before everything else. That's why it has to continue on forever. This is the beginning. And he says he declares the end from the beginning. So here it is. We're at the end. It's time to be at the beginning. So God created light from darkness. Jesus made you holy when you were a sinner. He called and saved us out of darkness. We didn't just decide to come to him. He intervened and brought us. And so keeping your days from evening and morning one day, that's honoring the fact that he brought you out of darkness into light. Amen? <clears throat> God started with the night of Satan's rule and he turned it all over and made it the day of life. Amen? Honoring and keeping the Saturday seventh day Sabbath from sunset to sunset is honoring God's renewal of the earth and bringing forth life on it. God Almighty entered the Sabbath day by resting. That is, the sovereign of the universe stopped what he was doing. Think about that for a minute. The sovereign of the universe who makes all things and who sustains all things by his word stopped what he was doing. 
That's pretty heavy duty. And he created a recurring space of time by resting. And we went to Exodus 16, and we talked about how the Sabbath was instituted before we get to the Ten Commandments. So let's go there. Let's go to Exodus 20. Because, see, in Exodus 16, he made the Sabbath covenant with you. It's an eternal covenant. It's a never-ending covenant. And then in Exodus 20, he gives you the Ten Commandments. So the Sabbath is already a commandment before the Ten Commandments. Wow. That's heavy. That's heavy. And when we get to the Sabbath command in the Ten Commandments, the first word is remember. The first word is remember. Because he already gave it to you. Y'all didn't get that? We're the house of Joseph, specifically the son of Manasseh. And Manasseh, Joseph named him, the Lord has made me forget. So he has to tell us to remember because we can't remember because the Lord has made... Somebody got it. So we all get that tomorrow morning when you're down the grocery aisle. You just all said, hey, that, remember, okay, I got it now. you got to remember the Sabbath because he's already given you the Sabbath and we're a nation that forgets everything. We forget everything. History in America is what happened last week. People my age don't remember what happened in the Cold War, even though they grew up in it. Young people in their 30s think history started in 2014. They think that's year two. They don't think there's any years before 2014. Come on, y'all know I'm right. <clears throat> this is a separate covenant of blessing. Do you ever think that's why the devil wants you to break it so bad? He's trying to interrupt your cycle of blessing. So he comes in chunks out a Sabbath, and then your whole cycle of blessing is completely blown apart. And he's got you where he wants you. You can't be blessed now because you broke Shabbat. The whole country's breaking Shabbat, and the whole country's getting, the curses are coming in now. They're coming in. They're flying in like crazy. So for all of you in the millennial generation, you don't see it. You think it's caused by global warming. These curses aren't caused by global warming and SUVs and electric power and, and the utility companies. These curses are caused by the sin in this country. You confiscate every dime in America and turn everything off. The curses are still coming. Unless we quit sinning, this place is going to get wrecked. Now in Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments are given. And the Fourth Commandment says, Remember the Sabbath day. <clears throat> so what do we do? We forget it. Let's play ball. Let's go shopping. We've got to get our groceries. When I was a kid, you had to cut grass. You cut grass on Saturday whether you liked it or not. This is the way it was when I grew up. You chained it that lawnmower, boy. If you you he could you couldn't start it, he started it for you. Now push. <laughs> now push. And don't run over that log. Again. <laughs> get some of y'all get that. The fourth commandment is reminding you to keep holy what God has already given you in Exodus sixteen, and that is a recurring space of holy time. You see it here in verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It's important. Now, let's go back to over to Leviticus 23. I want to show you that this is a, a feast day. <clears throat> now, back in the day, we focused so much on what could not be done on the Sabbath. I mean, we must have had the most elaborate rule system on planet Earth for what could not be done on the Sabbath. Don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Somebody come over to your house, first thing to do is put their hand on the TV to see if you've been watching TV. <laughs> oh yeah, it's back in the day, man. It's old school, right? <clears throat> but what we missed is that it's a day to celebrate. It's not a day to, don't do this. It's not an adult time out. Go stand in the corner. <clears throat> you know, I read Laura Ingalls Wilder. You're not supposed to read her anymore because of she wasn't exactly flattering to the Native Americans, but they weren't exactly flattering in the day she grew up in. So, you know. But anyway, it was talking about the Sabbath day, and they supposed it to be Sunday when she was growing up in Missouri, and the children had to sit on a chair, a hard wooden chair, all day long and be quiet. Now, I don't know about you, but my kids had too many calories for that. You'd have to, you'd, they'd have to fast for like six days to be able to sit on that chair and not move for the day or make any noise. And I had, I had girls, and they had a lot of calories. So I used to take them and run them. 
Don't have to be quiet in church, right? See, I don't know. See, back in the worldwide days, you had to care. Your kids had to be quiet. It couldn't be like you've seen at Hungry Hearts and the kids running around like little heathens and stuff. You didn't get to do that back in the day. Deacons were coming over there and telling you to get them out. You couldn't interrupt them. I mean, they made noise. That's it. Done. I mean, I don't care if they were just talking. Done. Out. You. Hey, let's go. <clears throat> and, you know, so you had to. I, I would run the calories out of them. That way they'd be ready for a nap. See, I, I have a hard time with parents. I tell them this good advice, and they don't listen. They just think I'm being ugly. But you got to run them. you got to run. Hey, we're going we're to race to the telephone pole over there. Let's go, uh, boys. Who can, who can be the first one there and back? you got to run the calories out of them. Lanise, on the other hand, every day during the week would make them lay down on the blanket and take a nap at service time. So, you know, you you got to condition them, right? You, you can't just show up at church when they've been wild heathens all week and expect them to be behave at church. That's not going to happen. So we would condition them, and then I'd run the calories out of them. I wasn't taking any chances. <laughs> Some of y'all got that. Some of y'all. Leviticus 23 and verse 1. The Lord said to Moshe, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, These are my appointed times. The Hebrew word is moed. It means the holy convocations. King James says holy convocations. And the reason I'm bringing this up in the King James, moed is a lot of things. And so these are appointed times, which is an important part of it. You've got you to be there. You have an appointment with God, and you can't fail to be there. But see, just appointed time doesn't convey that part. A convocation does. A convocation is a required assembly. You can't not be there. Have yourself there. You hear what I'm saying? It's a convocation. Do not fail to appear. In several other places he says that. Do not fail to appear. So I'm always freaking out on holy days when folks don't show up. Because we read this to you. We read this to you so you know it. Do not fail to appear. That's important, right? The appointed feast of the Lord, which you're to proclaim, is sacred assemblies. It's sacred time. It's holy time. It's required time. Now look, look at verse 3. There are six days to work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of rest, a day of sacred assembly or holy convocation. you got to be there. He's not asking you. He's not saying it when it's convenient. He's not saying it when it works out. He said, if you ain't contagious, be there. Except for those of you in the rest of the world, that's be there. But in the South, we say be there. And it means make sure you are there. Make sure. See to it. Don't not show up. Has to be something real important. Don't not show up. Amen. You see it right here. You're not to do any work wherever you live. It is a Sabbath to the Lord. And so this is a time to celebrate. So your best weekly meal should be on Shabbat. You put on your nice clothes on Shabbat. You, you celebrate on Shabbat. This is the whole 24-hour period when your whole weekly life revolves around Shabbat. And then you've got to go to work. How, how do we used to say it? Life was sweet and then it's Sunday. I go to work on Sunday, by the way. For some of y'all, life is sweet and then it's Monday. But for me, i got to go to work tomorrow morning. So life was sweet and then it's Sunday, right? So you have the joy of Shabbat. You have the celebration of Shabbat. You have the worship in Shabbat. You get the fellowship in Shabbat. And a little teaching, maybe, right? Yeah. And then when it's over, it's back, back to work. Amen? Amen? So we're commanded to celebrate the goodness of God in our lives, to put away worry and work and shout a hallelujah of praise. I want to skim a Psalm 92. This is a psalm about Shabbat. just want to skim a little bit of Psalm 92 here. Very, very important psalm. Somebody was wanting to pray this as protection over some soldiers one time, and I thought to myself, if they're not keeping Shabbat, you can't. Actually, if you pray this over somebody like that, you make them liable for Shabbat. I don't want to do that, man. I mean, our service folks need deserve better, amen? Mm -hmm. But our service folks deserve off on Shabbat. Amen. amen? That's why the Arabs attacked on Yom Kippur. That's why God delivered them. They attacked on Yom Kippur, and they got their head handed back to them. 
Oh, just, uh, I forget what show it is that shows all the, the miracles that happened in Israel for the Jewish people during those wars, but one of them was during the Yom Kippur War, and this guy had two tanks, maybe three, and they routed an entire field of 200 Egyptian tanks. And after the war, the guys were talking. After the peace, the Egyptians and the Israelis were talking. And, and the, the one Jew said, man, what made you guys back up? He goes, did you see all those people? We didn't have nobody. No, don't tell. Don't lie to me. We saw all those people. We, we could not. We, we was outgunned, man. We backed up. And the Jews guy going, no, there's only two tanks and one of them was broke. No, there wasn't, don't lie to me, there wasn't two tanks. We saw, we saw not only a bunch of people on the ground with you, it was the folks in the sky. We saw, uh, we saw Abraham. That's what the Muslims were saying. We saw Abraham. We wasn't fighting Abraham. No, we had it home. So God did miracle after miracle after miracle because they were dumb enough to attack on Yom Kippur. Yeah, so we need to keep the Sabbath. I mean, we want to win the next war, amen? amen. All right, so... It starts out in verse 1. It is good to praise the Lord and make music to your name, O Most High, to proclaim your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night, to the music of the ten-string lyre and the melody of the harp. Okay, that's all fantastic, but we got real jams up in here. Amen? For you make me glad by your deeds, O Lord. I sing for joy at the works of your hands. For how great are your works, O Lord, and profound your thoughts. The senseless man does not know, the fool does not understand. That though the wicked spring up like grass and all evildoers flourish, they will be forever destroyed. But you are exalted, O Lord, forever. Surely your enemies, O Lord, surely your enemies will perish and all evildoers will be scattered. For you have exalted my horn like that of a wild ox. Fine oils have been poured on me. My eyes have seen the defeat of my adversaries and my ears have heard the rout of my wicked foes. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green proclaiming the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no wickedness in him. This is the song for the Sabbath day. So we talked about holy. How can things be made holy? How can time be made holy? I'll tell you how things can be made holy. It's by the Spirit of God. Things can only be made holy by the Spirit of God. Amen? Amen. We read in Genesis 2 that God made the Sabbath holy. He does that by putting His divine presence into the day. It's another reason to worship a lot during the day, right? His divine presence is in the day. How much of his divine presence can you experience in one Sabbath? That's a challenge, by the way. Some of y'all get that. How much can you experience in one Sabbath? How much time are you going to make for him? You don't need to do anything else, do you? Now, Exodus 31, we're going to talk about this, this eternal Sabbath covenant. It is an eternal covenant of blessing in Exodus 31. It's an amazing little passage of Scripture right here. Five little verses. They'll turn your world upside down. Not mine because they already did it 34 years ago. I live on this. This is what sustains me. <clears throat> this little passage right here. It's a great passage. The heading in my Bible says the Sabbath. So he's been talking about all kind of great things the temple furniture, the appointments of the tabernacle, the showbread, the oil, all the stuff. And then he, then he comes right back to what's important, the Sabbath. You see, the tools are made to be used on the Sabbath. The worship tools are used to be made on, are made to be used on the Sabbath. That's how you access God. <clears throat> Verse 12, the Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, you must observe my Sabbaths. He's not asking. He's telling you. Now, I know in the South we don't like to be told. I know in the South when someone tells us something, we usually don't do it just because we were told. But the Lord is telling us. Now, I don't know about you, but my dad had a saying. Boy, don't make me tell you twice. Except usually by the, when he said that, I, I didn't pay any attention to the first time. And now I've got less than 30 seconds to perform, and I don't have a clue what it is I'm supposed to do. You just got to take your best guess and, and hope you don't get hurt too bad. 
Yeah, somebody back there right, he just gets it. He said he's not pretty good back there. He he got it. Yeah, yeah. And your dad said that too, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Did. Didn't like hearing that. That was not a good thing, man. My day was about to take a real bad turn when I heard that. Boy, don't make me tell you twice. God's going to tell you two or three times in this passage right here. He's going to tell you two or three times. Now, if our human fathers, for our own well-being, would say that, how much more our Heavenly Father, who's about to tell us about four or five times in this passage, make sure you keep Shabbat. Amen? Amen. Now, after 34 years, I don't to be told anymore. Right? After 34 years, I can't wait to get to Shabbat. Tonight I'll be singing. It's only six days until Shabbat. Right? I'll just be singing this at work tomorrow. Oh, it's only six days until Shabbat. Right? This will be the sign between me and you forever. This, for the generations to come, it's the Hebrew ha'olam. It means forever. At no point in the new heavens and the new earth will there ever not be a seventh day Sabbath. I don't know what that means for people in spirit bodies, but whatever it means, it will be there and we'll be keeping it. <clears throat> so that you may know that I am the Lord who makes you holy. You see this. Look at this in your Bible. You read that for yourself. Look at your words on paper and make sure you get this. It's the only sign you have that the true and living Creator God is going to make you holy is by keeping that Saturday Sabbath. Okay? <clears throat> Does your Sabbath keeping make God Almighty think you get this? See, I'm not going to make that call. He is. I'm not making the call. This is between you and him. If he's not happy with your Sabbath keeping, you're not going in the rescue. I said it out loud. If he's not happy with your Sabbath keeping, you're not going in the rescue. I don't care what the name of your church is. I don't care who your pastor is. It's right here. We're in, the, we're in verse 13. We've only read two verses of this passage. And he has made this crystal clear, I hope. Observe the Sabbath because it's holy to you. You want to be holy? you got to get in Shabbat. Anyone who desecrates it must be put to death. I didn't make this book up. So you're standing at the time right before the rescue, and immediately following the rescue is the tribulation. Do you really want to go into the tribulation with a death sentence from God Almighty? Not smart. <clears throat> Whoever does any work on that day must be cut off from his people. So you're going to get cut off from Jesus if you don't keep the Sabbath. That's hard. For six days work is to be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Okay, now look, we're getting into priesthood stuff. We advance prayer. We're learning how to get into some of these things. One of the first things you've got to understand is you got to be real careful with holy things. you got to be real. God gets real particular about how you handle holy things. My worst enemies will tell you in the church that is, that I, I am real particular about handling holy things. They'll all tell you, well, he may be this and that, but when it comes to holy things now, you, you can bet he's going to do it right. They'll all tell you that because they know. They've been around me. Not, hey, that's holy. I'm, uh, uh, no, 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 no. No, you don't touch the holy things. You come up in the holy things, whoo, you better be the right person. Everything better be exactly right. Uzzah reached out to keep the ark from falling off the cart and died. Yeah. Right? That ark, that ark was coming off of that cart. See, y'all ain't getting that when you read it. That ark was coming off. It was going to bust on the ground. No telling what would have happened to them people if they let that happen. He gave his life. Because, first of all, it wasn't supposed to be on a cart. And second of all, it was supposed to be the Levites. And so we're completely out of order. No telling. What would have happened to them people for doing it that way? The Philistines might have got away with it because they didn't know better. But when you're talking about people got a Torah, somebody should have cracked that, rolled that scroll out and said, how do we got to do this thing? They'd already been there a couple hundred years. You're supposed to carry that ark with the Levites. Yeah, buddy. He didn't say nothing about rolling no cart. Mm-hmm. Comes to holy things. But he's telling you the Sabbath is holy. He's telling for you, you the individual, the Sabbath is holy. You've got to be careful how you handle Shabbat. 
Whoever does any work on the Sabbath must be put to death. Now, he said it to you twice. Not to mention the fact he said, I'm going to cut you off. Now, which of you, who of you can afford to be cut off from God? I mean, we only stand in by the blood of Jesus to start with, right? We can't afford to have that taken away. Amen? So he's telling you, he's telling you, verse 16, the Israelites are to observe the Sabbath, celebrating it for the generations to come as an everlasting covenant. It will be the sign between me and the Israelites forever, for in six days the Lord made heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he abstained from work and rested. So he ties it back to creation. He ties it back to when the command was given. He ties it back to the eternal covenant that existed from Adam and Eve. We're all descendants of Adam and Eve, right? Noah wouldn't have been saved on that boat if it wasn't for Sabbath keeping. We're all descended from Noah, right? If you're not an Israelite or you don't believe me telling you that the United States is an Israelite, you surely are grafted into Jesus who is an Israelite. So it just doesn't matter how you want to look at it. This is your sign. You've got to do it. For more information, please write for our book, God's Holy Sabbath, at HungryHeartsMIN at AOL.com. This is important. His divine presence in you is what makes you holy. And the divine presence in the day is what makes the Sabbath holy. And the Sabbath is the sign from God that he's making you holy. So when you break Sabbath, then you're showing that God's not making you holy. Oh, wow, that's really... Working on the day makes you common. It takes you out of holiness. I don't care what the name of your church is. You can't be holy if you're not keeping the Saturday Sabbath. Amen? That's just straight word. <clears throat> now... Seminaries come up a few times in the last couple of weeks. Teachers. Teachers in seminary. They all know this is true. But they sign a contract. They sign a contract when they join the church that they're teaching in. You teach here, I have to make you sign a contract. Didn't want to do it, but for legal reasons, we ended up having to do it. Let's go there. Matthew chapter 7. <clears throat> I'm going to show you this. Matthew chapter 7. This is too important. Just say it. <clears throat> For those of you in TV land, go to Matthew chapter 7. Maybe not now, but I want you to see this verse in this Bible because this is so important. Matthew chapter 7, verse 22, said, Many will come to me on that day. Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drive out demons and perform miraculous signs. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you workers of iniquity. The NIV says you evildoers, but in the King James, it's workers of iniquity. Let me explain to you what workers of iniquity means. It's a, com it's a complex phrase in the Greek, and it means this. People who make a living telling you Torah is done away. So right here, <clears throat> depart from me, you workers of iniquity. These are people who earn their living telling you Torah's done away. Now these people have been to seminary, and their seminaries will tell you that Saturday is the Sabbath. As a matter of fact, the Catholic Church will tell you that their authority over all churches on the earth is based on the fact they changed the day from Saturday to Sunday, and everybody follows them. They all know Saturday's the Sabbath. But they earn their living telling you it's done away. God help them. Man, that's bad. That's bad. I don't want to be nowhere around these people on Judgment Day. Man, if that's the day I can cut, cut class and go fishing, I'm, I'm not going to be there. I don't even fish and I'll go fishing. I, mean, I don't want to be nowhere around that because, man, the Lord going to toast these people. I don't, want, no, I don't, I don't even want to feel the heat from when I'm getting toasted. I put my asbestos suit on when I'm fishing, man. I get me some air conditioner or something, man. Man, you, how on earth do you know this New Testament and you know this verse right here and you know what the Greek is and you let anybody give you a paycheck for telling them Torah is, not, not, is done away? How on earth can you do that? Unless you just flat don't believe any of it. Because I've read this verse. I, you can't pay me enough money to tell you Torah's done away. <clears throat> what are you going to give me? The whole earth? That's not enough. It's not enough. I don't want to go in there like a fire for telling you that. No. 
I'm all. What do you always hear Pastor Bill say? Keep Torah. Keep Torah. You better keep that law. You better keep that law. People get tired of hearing me say it. And he says, oh, you just preach the same thing again. I have people leave and say, oh, you preach the same thing all the time. We can't take it anymore. What else do you want me to tell you? The book is true. What else can I tell you besides the book is true? You've got to do it. There, I mean, I can slice it and dice it different for you every week and maybe sear it on one side or the other. Maybe different. Maybe we put Chinese spice on it one day and maybe we'll put cilantro with it and taco sauce the next. But it's all the same. you got to keep torn. The book is true. I don't care how I redo this. It says it in the book, in the front. It says it in the back. Torah is true. You've got to live it. It says it in Re- Revelation. It says it in the book before Revelation in Jude. It says it in Peter and John and James. They all tell you the same thing I'm telling you. You've got to keep this. It's important. How oh, you preach the same thing? Well, yeah. At least, I, at least I'm not a worker of iniquity. <laughs> Isaiah 58. <clears throat> I am not a worker of iniquity. Oh, my goodness. I, I tell you, I read some things in the Bible scares me to death for other people. <clears throat> I mean, scares me for other people. Because you know what? I, I know Yeshua pretty well. I don't know one thing. I don't want to cross him. You no, know, I, I love him dearly. And I don't want to cross him for that reason. But I've seen what he does to people. You know, you got that little, you got that little episode in, in the New Testament where he makes a cord of whips. I don't know what he did to that dude. But everybody else ran. Now look, I, I've seen a lot of guards. I've met a lot of folks in the service. I ain't never seen a service man talk about throwing his weapon down and running. I ain't never met one. I've never met one talk about throwing. The, maybe the French do that. I don't know. That's a, that's a joke from the fir, first Gulf War. But I, mean, but I don't know any Americans that want to throw their guns down and run because somebody come in with a whip. But whatever he did to that first guy, they threw their weapons down and ran. Man, I wouldn't want to be him. Whew. Isaiah 58, verse 13. <clears throat> if you keep your feet from breaking the Sabbath and doing as you please on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight, why not just make it delightful? <clears throat> why call it something? Why not just make it fun? <clears throat> and the Lord's holy day honorable. And if you honor it by not going your own way and not doing as you please or speaking idle words, then... Now look, a lot of y'all didn't take math. I know it's West Tennessee. But when you have an if followed by a then, you can't have the then unless you do the if. I forget the name of it now, but you take geometric proofs. It's an if-then... If has to proceed to then. So everybody in the South wants to then. They don't want to do the if. You've got to do these things to get what follows. <clears throat> then you'll find your joy in the Lord. You want joy in the Lord? You've got to keep the Sabbath. And I will cause you to ride on the heights of the land. This is a word play on the rescue. That's a word play on the rescue of the saints. To ride on the heights of the land. If you want rescue, you'll keep the Sabbath and feast on the inheritance of your father, Jacob. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. So you want these good things? Then you've got to keep the Sabbath. You've got to make it a delight. This is a prophecy for our time. Make it a delight. Make it the highlight of your week. Have your best meal. Put on your good clothes. Where, put on the best music. Enjoy life. Make it good. Enjoy church. Enjoy church. John 14. And it's a great time to make time to be in the presence of the Lord. John 14. Verse 21, whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one that loves me. Now this word commands in the, in the NIV is the Greek word in tole, and it means the Ten Commandments. They, they kind of wrote it commands so they could kind of fudge on that. You know how they like to fudge on in the New Testament on what's in the Old? But that word in tole means the Ten Commandments. So if you keep the Ten Commandments, then you love Jesus. That's what he says right here. Red letters, right? He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. 
The presence of the Lord is on the Sabbath. He's not going to do this for you Monday at dinner. He's not going to do it Tuesday at work. He's not going to do it Wednesday at the barber shop. He's going to do it on Shabbat. He's going to come to you on Shabbat and show himself to you. The commandments are expounded in the rest of the law. For instance, we have a commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. And then you've got uh, Leviticus chapter 18 telling you all kinds of relations you are to avoid. And so it's not just the commandment, a prohibition against adultery. It's all of the commandments against relations you're to avoid. But the Ten Commandment about adultery is the, com- the peg and then all the other laws hang on that peg. It's the, how the other statutes... So he shouldn't have to tell you any more than that, amen? You already ought to have enough sense to leave everybody else alone, right? But since we're stupid and we don't have enough sense, he's got to be like a parent with a little kid, right? Yeah. So your kid comes to you and you say, go play in the yard. So you come out and you can't find them. They're not in the yard. Then you've got to go hunting all over the neighborhood. Yeah. Well, you said play in the yard. Yeah, yeah, the yard, not the neighbor's yard, four houses over, <laughs> right? And then you've got to delineate it. Don't leave the fence, yeah, stay out of the road. Well, my dad used to tell me to go play in traffic, so I <laughs> he was kidding. But you know, you know, just like God will tell you one thing, and He's got to come back and tell you fifteen other things because we keep testing it. Well, does it mean I can't do that? Does it mean I can't do this? Well, what about this over here? Well, I was only doing that, and so God has to nail it down for you. So that each commandment has a lot of supporting rules to go along with it in the Torah. That's why they're here. They're here because we're knuckleheads and we just won't listen. We're like little kids. We're, we're God's kids. And he's, he's gonna, about to give us a spanking. <clears throat> now verse 23. If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. What did Jesus teach you? Think not, I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And the word fulfill in the Greek does not mean he did it so you don't have to. The word in the Greek means he came to give you an example of how you are to do it. Because if your righteousness does not surpass that of the Pharisees and the scribes of the law, then you will certainly not enter into the kingdom of God. Now, if you obey his teaching, my father will love him, and we will come to him, and we will make our home with him. Now, that gave about four ladies, the, the willies, the heebie-jeebies. They're wanting to get up now and run to the house because they don't want God showing up looking the way it looks. Note to self, clean up on Thursday. Clean up on Thursday. You know why you clean up the house on Thursday for Shabbat? Because you're not going to have time on Friday. Amen. It's not going to happen. You might get time on Thursday if you're thinking ahead. But if you don't do it Thursday, you can bet. You can bet. You can bet everything you own in the bank that it's not going to happen on Friday. And you'll, you'll cash that baby out every time. Odds on that are million to one, right? So, <clears throat> he who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. So he's telling us that if we'll keep his commandments, the Sabbath is the queen of them, that they will come and make their home with us. So now, Friday afternoon, about 3 o'clock, does your house look like it's ready for the father and the son to show up for dinner? It should. Because they're coming. They're coming, right? Now, you can't see this, but i got about six panic faces in here. <laughs> I'm going to leave that alone. If you reject this teaching from Genesis to Maps and you really don't love him. Now, one time I was going over this verse and we lost about four viewers on, on YouTube. So don't cut out on me because I say this stuff. I didn't make this up. This is God talking. This is Jesus. These are red letter words, man. Take them to heart. Don't get mad and offended because I'm telling you, you've got to keep the Ten Commandments, including the Sabbath, and, and, and cut us off and don't watch. Take it to heart. Get your Bible out. Blow the dust off of it. Get up in here. Don't listen to some man tell you it's done away with. He's being paid to tell you that. He doesn't really believe it himself. Which begs the question, why are you in a church where a man's telling you something he doesn't believe just because he gets paid? Watch me on YouTube. I'm not getting paid. I believe every word I'm telling you and I live it. And I live it. I've had to rebuke some of the best Torah teachers in this country for not living this. And I didn't do it out of spite or meanness. I did it because I wanted them to get on the program. And they did, praise God. Obedience brings presence. 
Obedience brings blessing. It brings holiness. Do you want Jesus to come back or not? Or have you, or have you had enough of this crazy mess? I couldn't even watch the news this week. It was so crazy. You know, I, I watch news at 11, right? Right before I go to sleep. I had to, I had to watch cooking shows. I, no, I couldn't deal. I couldn't, I couldn't even sleep one night anyway. <clears throat> These people are nuts. All they want to talk about is taking my guns and my money. Senator Warren, don't try that mess. Don't, don't, don't even try it. I, I, know, I know you think you've got it going on and all that, but just leave it alone, girlfriend. Leave it alone. You have no clue what's going to happen when you come down to Tennessee and try that mess. It's just not going to work. <clears throat> Would Jesus interpret your actions on the Sabbath day to mean you're ready for him to come and take you home? Are you obedient and looking for his presence on Shabbat? Are you showing him your true spirit-filled love on the Sabbath? So, so much so that he knows you want his return. Show Jesus by your actions this Sabbath that you want him back more than life itself. I want to thank you for watching today's message. I hope it encourages you to have a closer walk with Yeshua Messiah and it helps you to have a stronger love of your Bible. If you're interested in more information about Hungry Hearts Ministries, please go to our website, HungryHeartsMinistryWithAY.com or our other site, HungryHeartsChurch.com. We have many free materials there, including our quarterly magazine, Pursuit, which I've already offered, and I'm offering this free booklet. I want to thank you for watching. In two weeks, we're going to talk about the importance of eating right. God bless you, and we'll see you next time.